Australia, February of 1991. The seventh General Assembly of the World Council of Churches. A rock music concert by Aboriginals in the Assembly's worship tent. In this same tent, Orthodox ecumenists celebrated the Divine Liturgy. The Aboriginal rituals held in the Assembly tent included pagan elements. They were not simply a folkloric or cultural presentation. They expressed the pagan foundation of Aboriginal civilization. This assembly is a milestone for the World Council of Churches. The Holy Spirit was blasphemed. Pagan, pantheistic and animistic ideas were preached. And even our Lord was blasphemed. Come, the spirit of Amazon great forest now being murdered every day. The Korean Presbyterian theologian, Dr. Chung Hyung Kyung, together with all the spirits of creation, invoked the spirit of the liberator, our brother Jesus. Come, the spirit of the liberator, our brother Jesus. The presence of people of other religions at the assembly is clearly evident. Hindus, Buddhists, Jews, Muslims and others. Dr. Anatan Ram Rambachan, Hindu. Vigale Mahinda, Buddhist. Not only were they welcomed, but they even took an active part in the proceedings. Religious unity is especially important since it enables to establish a peaceful world. Of their ancient cultures, paganism, blasphemies, heathens. But when churches in the north and west appropriate the consumerism, militarism, and paternalism, of our cultures, we speak of And the yet, theology. the Orthodox ecumenists still remain organic members of a pan-heretical Protestant organization. We have been listening to you for And they are the objects years. of the aggressive challenges of the third world theology of Dr. Chung, Fathers, who I does not hesitate to declare, Buddhism and shamanism are my mother, and my father is Christianity. Yes. We are dangerous, but in that danger, there is a walk of the Holy Spirit. Such, Open unfortunately, the is the fall of the Protestants, and a fall in which the Orthodox are earth. taking Thank part. You. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Meanwhile, the Orthodox ecumenists have drawn even closer to the Roman Catholics. How is this justified? Do the Roman Catholics perhaps have a different attitude towards other religions? Until about the middle of our century, the papacy was confined to a condition of isolation and monologue. An historical landmark is the Second Vatican Council, 1962 to 1965, which led to a spectacular openness, not only to other Christians, but also to other religions. 
the chief inspirer of this policy of openness, Pope Paul VI, on Pentecost 1964, established the office of the Holy See for non-Christians for the expansion of the interreligious vision. The politics of this policy of openness are expressed quite characteristically in the so-called apostolic journeys of the Pope throughout the world. The many impressive trips of the popes to the five continents, which were initiated immediately after Vatican II by Pope Paul VI, as well as the presence of Roman Catholics in non-Christian countries, posed the burning question of culture. How can the gospel be incorporated into? How will it gain a foothold in? And how will it be applied to the cultures of various peoples? Whatever the case, this process presents a danger with regard to the integrity of the Christian faith. Has Roman Catholicism succeeded in avoiding this danger? Unfortunately, Roman Catholicism has acknowledged the possibility of enriching Christianity by different cultures. But is it possible for Christianity to be enriched by different cultures, which are human products marked by sin, and especially cultures which are indissolubly tied to pagan, pantheistic, and animistic elements? It is clear then that Roman Catholicism, by means of a cultural theology, has accepted a new refined syncretism. present in the very heart of human cultures because he is present in man, in man, who is created in But what is the practical consequence of this new Roman Catholic theology? Elements of local cultures, which were built without Christ, have already entered into churches and have adulterated the spirituality of Christian worship. The Pope, in essence, preaches the insufficiency of the salvation in Christ since he finds answers in the writings of the Hindu Mahatma Gandhi. I follow the works and the writings of Mahatma Gandhi. I found answers, answers to me, answers to the Christians everywhere, fundamental answers. India has so much to offer to the world in the task of understanding man and the truth of his existence. Oddly, the Pope forgets the renewal of all things in Christ Jesus and the deification of man in Christ. 
He has discovered that India and Gandhi offer a new vision, man as worshipper of an impersonal absolute through self-realization. Can it be that Roman Catholics wish Christianity to be enriched by such purely Hindu beliefs? And what she offers specifically is a novel spiritual vision of man, man a pilgrim of the Absolute. Did not Mahatma Gandhi put it this way? What I want to achieve, what I have been striving and pining to achieve, is self-realization self to see God face to face. The Roman Catholic theology of culture leads to an affirmation of other religions. In 1985, in Casablanca, Morocco, in front of 80,000 young Muslims, the Pope sanctioned the dialogue with Islam and assured the Muslims that we have the same God. On his trips throughout the world, the Pope pays visits to the leaders of the local religions and expresses his respect for them and for their religions. On what do the Roman Catholics base this affirmation of theirs regarding other religions? The Church, they contend, is the usual and chief path of salvation. The non-Christian religions are other paths of revelation and salvation. They all lead to the common God, to the common Father. Cultural theology and the syncretistic views of other religions have prepared the ground for a new theology of global peace and the creation of a new civilization through the cooperation of the world's religions. And the heritage of Mahatma Gandhi speak, speaks to us still. And today, as a pilgrim of, path, of peace, I have come here to pay homage to Mahatma Gandhi, hero of humanity. Mahatma Gandhi told that if all men and women, whatever the differences between them, cling to the truth with respect for the unique dignity of every human being, a new world order, a civilization of love can be achieved. May God guide us and bless us as we strive to walk together hand in hand and build together a world of peace. Mahatma Gandhiji Amarachen, may Gandhi live forever. Satyahinsa Amarache, may truth and nonviolence live forever. The openness of the Vatican to other religions for mutual knowledge and mutual enrichment is being steadily expanded. Rapprochement and the exchange of gifts and ideas are the first stage. What is the next stage? At the initiative of Pope John Paul II, on October the 27th, 1986, in Assisi, Italy, the first meeting of religions for the peace of the world took place.
150 representatives from 12 religions took part. Also present were the four great worldwide interreligious organizations. The Interreligious Association for Religious Freedom, the World Congress of Faith, the Temple of Understanding, and the World Conference on Religion and Peace. Present were Buddhists, Muslims, Aboriginals from Africa and America, Zoroastrians, Sikhs, Hindus and Shintoists. Also present was Elio Toaf, chief rabbi of the Central Synagogue of Rome, which the Pope had visited a few months previously. Christians of almost all confessions were represented. The World Council of Churches, Nestorians, Non-Chalcedonians, Copts, Armenians, Malabarese, Roman Catholics, Old Catholics, Anglicans, Lutherans. Unfortunately, there was also a place at this pan-religious meeting for the Orthodox ecumenists, who indeed played a decisive role in its realization. There were delegates from the Orthodox churches of Finland and Czechoslovakia, the Patriarchate of Bulgaria, the Patriarchate of Romania, the Patriarchate of Georgia, the Patriarchate of Moscow, and the Patriarchate of Antioch. A special place next to the Pope was occupied by Archbishop Runcie, the presiding bishop of the Anglicans, and Archbishop Methodius of Theatera, the representative of the Patriarchate of Constantinople. The churches of Alexandria and Jerusalem declared their spiritual ascent with messages. The Church of Greece unfortunately participated in a prayerful way with a well-known Byzantine choir from Athens which chanted at the three main presentations at Assisi. was the only speaker. In his address, he equated the prayer of Christians to the true and only God with the prayer of all other religions. Peace 
this, he emphasized, is a fruit of prayer, which in the various religions expresses a relationship with a supreme power. Pope's speech was followed by silent prayer, joint prayer. Those of other religions were assigned Christian churches to perform their worship services and to pray for peace. The Buddhists prayed in the parish church of St. Peter. They placed a small statue of Buddha on the altar. Hindus assembled in the church of Santa Maria Maggiore. Sitting around the sanctuary, they invoked the whole succession of their gods. The Muslims gathered in the monastery of St. Anthony. The aboriginals of Africa prayed in the church of St. Gregory and prepared their peace pipes inside the sanctuary. The Shintoists were assigned to the Benedictine monastery. was truly a great fall for the orthodox ecumenists. They were put on an equal level with the whole spectrum of Christian heresies and with the non-Christian religions.
our spotless orthodoxy was indescribably humiliated through these orthodox ecumenists. The ecumenist journey, which began in 1920 with a proclamation of cooperation and with the hobnobbing of orthodox and heterodox, has ended up in joint prayers with heathens to the supposed common father. Where further, we wonder, will this journey of apostasy lead? the establishment of a World Council of Religions was proposed, analogous to the United Nations organization, an organization which would be distinguished by its moral influence in matters of world peace and justice. that God should have heard these theatrical prayers and granted peace to the world? It was Christians who, unfortunately, closed the pan-religious service of joint prayer. concluded this prayer to this supposed common father with the Our Father. way, the Pope underscored his leading role in the worldwide syncretistic movement towards the pan-religion of the New Age. This was truly a great fall 
for the orthodox ecumenists. But unfortunately, it was not the last. Within a year, in December of 1987, Patriarch Demetrius prayed at the Vatican in a fully official way with Pope John Paul II, the instigator and leader of the Babylon of Assisi. Since 1986, the Vatican has continued its effort towards the ecumenical cooperation of religions. Every year, the Roman Catholics organize a similar interreligious meeting in different cities in Europe. In Rome in 1987 and 1988. In Warsaw in 1989. In Bari in 1990 and in Malta in 1991. In 1992, the meeting took place in Brussels. Unfortunately, the presence of orthodox ecumenists is always strongly evident. They steadfastly follow the Roman Catholics in their interreligious openness. The seventh meeting of religions took place in Milan in 1993. At the famous La Scala of Milan, the start of the proceedings was announced by Mikhail Gorbachev, former president of the Soviet Union, who was also the main speaker. 300 representatives of 42 religions from the whole world took part. On the final day, there was a march for peace in the Cathedral Square of Milan. Thousands of people demonstrated their enthusiasm. In 1994, the eighth meeting was held, again in Assisi. How was it that the Orthodox Ecumenists yet again took part in this global apostasy? How could they place our holy faith on the same level as heresies and the other religions of the world? Would the apostles have agreed to orthodox membership in a pan-heretical and pan-religious organization as members of equal standing? Would they have agreed to cooperate with heretics and heathens for the peace and security of the world? Protagonisti hanno imparato ad incontrarsi 
the idea of cooperation of religions has been wholly implanted. But where is this hobnobbing of Christians and heathens leading? The truth is being relativized. The new world order, the new global spirituality, and the new global ethic are already taking flesh and bones. La lingua dell'amore, pronto a sottolineare soprattutto ciò che unisce. E cosa può unirci oggi? Questo è lo spirito di Assisi. The Roman Catholic Cardinal Edward Cassidy has underlined what it is that chiefly unites religions. And this is the spirit of Assisi. is the spirit of Assisi. The lights of all religions must be united together so that the world may be enlightened. does the unique light of the world, our Lord Jesus Christ, have in this syncretistic union? What communion hath light with darkness? Chicago, 1893, the starting point of the interreligious movement. The first parliament of religions opens the way for the proliferation of oriental religions in the West. Chicago, 1993, second parliament of the world's religions. days, the Palmer House Hotel hosted more than 6,000 representatives of 250 religions and religious groups.
Roman Catholics contributed to the organization of the Parliament. Friends and representatives of many nations, many communities, and especially many faiths. The Vatican participated in a very official way. The secretary of the Pontifical Institute for Interreligious Dialogue was present, as was the Archbishop of Chicago, Joseph Bernardin. My dear friends, all of us who are here this afternoon truly believe that in our increasingly interdependent, limited, and divided world, there is a hunger for and a growing confidence in the wisdom the platform of the Parliament was not only a place for speeches, but also a place of prayer and worship by the most disparate groups and religions. Present were Unitarians. Buddhists, Sikhs, Muslims. This is indeed an occasion of shalom, of peace. Jews, sisters and brothers. If warfare and strength. Baha'ist. Very early religions were technological. Zoroastrians. And Hindus. American aboriginals celebrated a pagan ritual and made invocations. We love you and we know that you love us. Participated. More and more people are asking for information and places to gather to learn more about how they too can be in connection with the feminine energy by the traditions that we represent. Understanding. There was no shortage of groups of gurus or neo-gnostics with their typical New Age message. The time of religion is over. The time of spirituality. And we see with the power of modern weapons, we see that we can't afford wars much longer, can we? Religious or otherwise. So the issue is being forced one way or another. And we will see this. This tremendous coming together more and more. The Vatican participates in the Parliament and interreligious dialogues with a visionary goal, that a sacred treaty between religions be established for the building of a new global civilization. The Roman Catholics, having fallen from grace and truth, forget that the new creation is already in existence. It is the Church the body of the God-man Jesus. To create a 
next century as beautiful as this moon which is coming up in the horizon as a symbol of a new civilization, the civilization of solidarity, of justice, and inhabited by the good wishes of all human parts. Amen. And let's make that this our new name. civilization is based on humanism and has a purely this-worldly perspective. This was the vision of the parliament in Chicago. It's my prayer that this parliament becomes a watershed for the turning point of humanity. That's my prayer and my blessing. <laughs> My friends, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. The stirring address of the Dalai Lama in the huge city park, in front of 30,000 enthusiastic listeners, was very typical of the syncretistic vision of the parliament. Then the next, the question of is it a pluralism in religions. So naturally, the, the five billions of human beings, among five billions of human beings, oh, there are a lot of different religious positions. So under such circumstances, simply one religion cannot satisfy millions of different people. So therefore, it is, I say, it is obvious we must accept the existence of different religions as it can much more benefit for the humanity. Now obviously, you see, each one as you feel one's own religion is the best. I myself also feel Buddhism is best for me. But this does not mean that Buddhism is best for everyone. Clear. So under such circumstances, the spirit of pluralism and the spirit of harmony is very essential. Now the next question, can be possible? My answer is definitely yes, yes, yes. So therefore, you see, the, uh, the all religions, you see, the aim is more or less the same. All are you see, helping humanity. Now, the, I, I, have said, I believe, I am quite sure, if all major world religions come together, work together, and put common effort for betterment of humanity, I think we can do something. Yeah. As far as the Tibetan Buddhist is concerned, we already have you see, some uh, program that exchange the Tibetan Buddhist monks and nuns and Christian monks and nuns you see, exchange. So that's very, very useful, very helpful. Unfortunately, these syncretistic ideas have deeply influenced Christian ecumenists. Indeed, Roman Catholics, with the official approval of the Vatican, have taken an active part in the interreligious dialogues and have even become exponents of these anti-Christian beliefs. Monk, that is a Catholic monastic, and I belong to a group called Monastic Interreligious Dialogue which was formed under the direction of Rome for dialogue with the Eastern religion, especially with Buddhism, which has a monastic core to it. And to, uh, to be part of the world parliament of religions is very, very much part of what we do, of what we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to do it. So for us, it is a... Uh, 
It's a thrill to be here. It gives us a chance to meet with many people, to share with many people, and to help to break down many of the walls of misunderstanding or uh, confusion that exist in the world. As we meet each other and we understand each other, we share the same experience at our deepest levels. And when we come to understand this, then the rest of it seems to be detailed. Chicago, 1993. A feast of religious diversity. How could Christians have possibly taken part in the Babylon of Chicago? constitute different expressions of the same thing? And do they all lead to the same goal? Religions and cultures, indifferent to the truth, are being united in a syncretistic mosaic that gives us a glimpse of the future. All together, in a deadly embrace, they are being drawn into a pan-religious melting pot. The responsibility of the Vatican for the apostasy of Chicago is enormous and it cooperated, having given it financial backing and took part in a fully official way. How far will the fall of Roman Catholicism go? For how long will orthodox ecumenists pray with them? On July the 3rd, 1994, in Australia, a new ecumenical body was founded, the National Council of Churches of Australia. In the 
Roman Catholic Cathedral of St. Christopher, a special service was held for the establishment of this body. The service began with the Aboriginals in a pagan ceremony of purification in the sanctuary. Was this simply a folkloric display? Are such improprieties permitted in a Christian church? brought with them the purifying smoke and placed it before the altar. Roman Catholicism, in an effort to adapt the gospel to the cultures of different peoples, admits the influence of pagan elements. It regards the introduction of non-Christian elements in worship as an enrichment of the church. And the churches increasingly are doing this. It's uh, all of the mainstream churches now uh, are actually doing this. Yet, is not the spirituality of Christian worship thereby adulterated? Very much part of the Byzantine court, and it's very much part of both the Orthodox and Roman Catholic liturgy, and also many parts of the Anglican Church. <laughs> I was told by one of the dancers that they actually have to prepare themselves to dance something like this and, and uh, read their minds of wrongful thoughts, uh, open themselves up and become quite vulnerable because, and let the spirit speak to them. Unfortunately, Orthodox ecumenists are also organic members of this council. The Patriarchate of Antioch, the Church of Romania, and the Ecumenical Patriarchate sent delegates to this ceremony. It is worthy of note that the Roman Catholics have abandoned the part of observers and now participate, indeed as leaders, in such ecumenical bodies. The representatives of the 13 member confessions had to pass through purifying smoke and the aboriginals would greet them. The Roman Catholic Archbishop of Canberra welcomed the new ecumenical organization. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I welcome you, one and all, to this truly historical occasion. It is my privilege to offer you the joyful hospitality of St. Christopher's Cathedral. I thank the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples for making us welcome. The Aboriginal ceremonial purification reminds us of the need for forgiveness and reconciliation. These are fundamental to the welfare of Australia and for the fulfillment of the aims of the National Council of Churches in Australia. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Afterwards, there was joint prayer. God, 
giver of gifts. You reveal the creative energy of the spirit in the abundance of gifts we share. For these we bless you. You call us to recapture the vitality and freshness of the Christian faith through fidelity to your life-giving word. Keep us in the truth revealed in Christ. Proprieties followed, even around the altar. Multicolored silk cloth made by women of different confessions symbolized the spirit that supposedly overshadowed those who were praying together. Catholic Bishop Bede Heather made known the principles of the National Council of Churches of Australia. The National Council of Churches in Australia will gather together 13 member churches in prayer and worship in order to express more visibly the unity willed by Christ for his church. The Anglican Church of Australia the list of the 13 members of the National Council of Churches of Australia, along with Anglicans, Nestorians, Monophysites, Roman Catholics and Protestants, unfortunately includes three Orthodox churches. The Greek Orthodox Church. Bishop Seraphim, assistant to the Greek Archdiocese of Australia, represented the Patriarchate of Constantinople. The Romanian Orthodox Church. We will. The Salvation Army. We will. The Syrian Orthodox Church. We will. And the Uniting Church in Australia. We will. And the Antiochian Orthodox Church. We will. We will. Proprieties, however, culminated in the entrance with the gospel by Aboriginal women.
from the Holy Gospel according to John. Chapter 17, verses 1 to 5 and verse 22. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, And the glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one and we are one. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Orthodox ecumenists endure taking part in these successive falls of the Roman Catholics. For how long will they follow the Roman Catholics in this non-Christian venture of theirs? Truly, the fall of the Orthodox Ecumenists is great. And this fall of theirs has been carried out in prayer and worship. adulterated the dogmatic and canonical tradition of the Holy Fathers, broke away from the Holy Orthodox Church, and are already playing a leading role in interreligious dialogues. And yet, the Orthodox Ecumenists, instead of calling the Roman Catholics to repentance and return, reckon them a sister church. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you can love like brothers in sincerity, Love one another deeply from the heart. <laughs> Is it possible for the zealots of ancestral piety to have relations and communion with the orthodox ecumenists of Assisi and Canberra? And to receive the blessings of the Fanar and the Vatican, and in common at that, Δεν θα ήθελα τίποτε άλλο περισσότερο να προσθέσω απόψε. I would not want to add anything further this evening to the enlightened address by Father Cyprian. Και πέρα από την ομιλία το δεύτερο θα μπορούσα να πω κύριε. And aside from his address, the second sermon I should say, were the documents that we saw this evening. So shocking that they tell their own story. Perhaps, had you not seen them, you might have said that we were talking fantasies and dreams. 
Unfortunately, however, what you have seen is a reality. Βλέπετε ότι η αποστασία όσο πηγαίνει και προχωρεί περισσότερο. Και από ό,τι διαβάζουμε... You see that apostasy, as it goes on and advances, as we read in the books of our church, must reach its peak for the Antichrist to come. From the signs of the times, then, we see how Christ is approaching. Christ is coming. And we must be prepared if we want, all the more so as the Christians that we are called and named. If we want to go forth and meet him, if we want to be united with him, and rejoice with him eternally. We should hold two things dearer than our sight, dearer than our eyes. First, the genuineness of orthodoxy. And I stress this word genuineness because, as Father Cyprian previously noted, today even the ecumenists want to be called orthodox. The genuineness of orthodoxy. But this alone is not sufficient, just as a bird does not fly with one wing, but with two wings. The second wing is orthopraxy, correct practice. The first, then, is the correct faith. And the second is the correct life so that we may be able to say to men who are far removed from the realm of the church what Philip said to Nathaniel, what we heard today in the Gospel, come and see. Come and see what orthodoxy means. I pray that in these difficult times that we are passing through, I stress and I repeat, and in the more difficult ones that await us, Christ may maintain us to the end of our life, to the final heartbeat, in the correct faith and the correct life. Amen.